Good morning and welcome. How are you liking the series that we're going through? The fruit, the whole fruit, and nothing but the fruit. We're in part eight of nine, and today we're looking at gentleness. So we're nearing the end. Remember, we're in a court of law. How is it going? How's the testimony going for or against you so far? You've been accused of having the fruit of the Spirit. How is the jury going to decide? You've heard so far of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. How has your life reflected these things? How does it reflect them in your daily life when people see you and interact with you? When you have opportunities to show these things, that don't come naturally, but because of your connection as a branch to the vine, as we've been looking at in John 15, they should come from you naturally. I've mentioned in the past, they should be like, I have freckles. And when I'm in the sun, the freckles come out. I can't make those freckles come out on my own. They come out naturally because of my skin and the reaction from the sun. So should the fruit of the spirit be in you because of your connection as a branch to the vine, getting the Holy Spirit running into you, they should come out of you naturally. And they are grouped together. They are not one, each individual of itself, independent of itself. They are the fruit, nine fruits together. And they make up the character of God. And so in looking at that, we should be displaying these things because of our connection to God through Christ. So as I said, we're looking at the vine and the branch in John 15, verses 1 through 15, and Galatians 5, 22 to 23, where the list of the fruit of the Spirit is found. And we remember that Jesus is the vine and God is the vine dresser. And as I said, we've done uh, seven of these, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. So let's go and turn to John 15, and let's read verses 1 through 8. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches, and those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But, it, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted to you. And verse 8 reads, When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples this brings a great glory to my Father. So, what have we learned so far? God is the one who tends the vineyard. Jesus is the source of what flows through us in the form of the Holy Spirit. We, as followers of him, are prepared for fruit growth by his word, by reading his word. And connection between the branch and the vine also allows relationship in both directions, both our relationship with him and his relationship with us. Fruit will abound when we stay connected, but without that connection, we will produce no fruit. And when a branch is barren, it is not receiving the life through the vine due to its disconnection. It is thrown away and burned. And then verse eight from the New American Standard reads, by this is my father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So last week we reviewed that it is by obedience to his word and our relationship to him through prayer that we stay connected to Christ, the vine, and therefore produce fruit. 
Fruit production is progressive. It goes from fruit to more fruit to much fruit. And the job of the vine dresser, who's God, he prunes and he encourages growth through his care and his cultivating of the vine. As we learned last week, answered prayer or answering prayer is an indication of our connection. The more we pray according to his will, the more we will have the things we ask for because they are things he wants us to have or that bring glory to him. So if fruit production is progressive, then f- point one is fruit quantity glorifies the Father. Fruit quantity glorifies the Father. Remember, the reason we display fruit is not to benefit us, but First, to glorify the Father. This is done by producing fruit that points others to him and therefore benefiting others also. When we display the fruit of the Spirit, we in essence show the attributes of Jesus and the Father. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are direct evidence that we have his salvation. Philippians 1.11 says, May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. Therefore, as we progress, as we grow more like Christ through the process of progressive sanctification, we grow as his disciples, following and becoming more like the master, our fruit quality increases. So point two is fruit quality is the proof of discipleship. First, fruit quantity glorifies the Father, and fruit quality is the proof of discipleship. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples, was verse 8. So, it's a natural process as we stay connected to Christ. The evidence of our relationship with him shows through the fruit we display in our thoughts and actions towards others and in our daily interactions, we show that we are growing also as his disciples. John 8, 31 to 32 says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So again, it is through our obedience to his word that our relationship, our connection, and our salvation are seen and shine forth. Because the fruit of the spirit will show and point to him as the source of freedom from sin and eternal life. So let's look at today's fruit, gentleness. What comes to mind when you hear the word gentle or gentleness? When I was thinking about it, I thought a mother with her newborn baby. How about the hand of a plastic surgeon performing his delicate work? Or just a hand of comfort on the shoulder of someone who has lost someone they loved? Whatever picture came to your mind, you certainly had a specific idea as to what that looks like to you. You know, our society and our culture tend to see gentleness not as a virtue, but as a weakness. In a similar way as kindness and goodness can be seen as the opposite of being strong, not being taken advantage of, or not being walked on, or not having strength. Hollywood tends to portray heroes as macho, all-conquering, usually a violent good guy who is all-powerful. Our society sees gentleness and humility as weakness, something to be avoided or get trampled on. But point three, gentleness is not a sign of weakness. Gentleness is not a sign of weakness. Depending on the context and translation, the NIV Bible translates the root praos into three different English words. Meek, which you'll find in Matthew 5.5, 5, humility in Titus 3.2, and gentleness in Galatians 5.23. 
Now, gentleness is not to be misunderstood as a weakness or a lack of internal strength, but in fact, as strength under control. Matthew 5, 5, the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. So this was understood to mean not by strength, but through a humble, contrite, meek, and gentleness, one would enter salvation and heaven. Remember, the Jewish world of Jesus' day, they wanted a mighty, valiant, conquering Messiah to relieve them from the occupation of Rome. They believed that their salvation would come by might, but Jesus, as he did throughout his ministry, would turn this thought upside down also. James 3.13 says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. This is the wisdom to live with godliness, a wisdom that leads not to passivity, but to strength under control. In the, in the fruit of the spirit is a form of godliness. Let me, let me rephrase that. If the fruit of the spirit is a form of godliness that exhibits the characteristics of God, what and who he is like, then what does the gentleness of God look like? Well, we can best understand it by point four, God's gentleness as a father and a shepherd. God's gentleness as a father and shepherd. Psalm 103, 13 to 14 says, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. So God sees us like a father. He knows us inside and out. He made us in his own image. He expects godliness from us. But it's also understanding. He is also understanding of our frailty and that he created us from dust. How do we see it? Well, this is the picture of us as earthly fathers. We expect, as we teach right from wrong, obedience from our children. But we also take into consideration their age and the level of their understanding. The younger the child, the more grace we show, understanding their ability to obey and giving consequences proportionately. Deuteronomy 131 says, as you saw how the Lord your God cared for you all along the way as you traveled through the wilderness, just as a father cares for his child, now he has brought you to this place. We can also see God's gentleness in the care for his people. What do we learn about God when looking at his care for the children of Israel in the desert? He cared for them for 40 years. He provided gentle care for them, providing their every need, even when they were disobedient and turned against him and turned against Moses. He provided food in the form of manna. He provided water, shade, protection gentle care of a people he loved and wanted to bless the world around them. We can also see through the life of a shepherd how God loves and cares, protects, and provides for us. Isaiah 40, 11 says, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. I love the picture of God as a loving and caring shepherd. The shepherd's sole attention, focus, and responsibility is to care, protect, and love his sheep. Their well-being is all he cares about. So whether you're an animal lover or not, the picture of a loving shepherd willing to give his life for his sheep is such a beautiful picture of God's gentleness and love for us. What are some biblical examples of God's care? Well, we can look at, at his gentleness. Let's look at, at uh, Hagar. In Genesis 16, you'll remember that Abraham's wife, Sarah, wanted to hurry things along for the child, and she figured she would know better than God, and she gave her handmaiden, her servant, Hagar, to Abraham to have a child. But once the child was born, Hagar started to despise Sarah. And so Sarah 
put her out, and she went out and wandering in the desert. Because of the Sarah's response, she left and wandered in the desert, pregnant, facing death. So this is before she had the child. Pregnant and facing death. But God gives comfort to her and to her son. God, and she gave God the name El Roy, the God who sees me. But again, after Ishmael's been born and he's older, in Genesis 21, 8 to 21, and Isaac has been born now, Ishmael starts to mock Isaac about their inheritance. And she and Ishmael, are, th um, Hagar and Ishmael are thrown out by Abraham. And she goes off and separates him and sits a uh, hundred yards away because she can't watch him die as he sit starving and without water. But God comes to her and he, he saves their lives. He provides water and care and he gives her a promise to make him a great nation and therefore promising his safety. What about Elijah, the prophet? He had just defeated 10 prophets of Baal and then executed them. But when the king went back and told Jezebel what had happened, she promised to have the same thing happen to him. So he runs and he hides. And how does God show his gentleness to Elijah? He tells him, go to Mount Sinai. So Elijah runs to, to Mount Sinai and goes into a cave, and God gives him sleep, gives, sends him food, baked bread from heaven, delivered by an angel. And Elijah asks to see God. And God says, you can't see me, but I will pass by. Turn away from the opening in the cave, and I will pass by. And there was a mighty wind that came by, but God wasn't in the wind. An earthquake came, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a great fire that passed across the face of the cave. But again, God was not in the fire. But then there was a gentle whisper and a still small voice. And God was there in his gentleness. And God's gentleness is loving and caring, taking into consideration our frailty, our vulnerability, our susceptibility to temptation or our disobedience. He still wants our best. That's his only care. He still only wants our best. He wants none to perish, none to be separated from him for eternity. How about Jesus, our vine? How can we see the gentleness from him? Remembering that Jesus is the vine, so as we are connected to Jesus as the vine and his spirit th flows through us, what does gentleness do? Gentleness look like through Jesus. Gentleness is the greatest strength of Jesus. Point five is gentleness, the greatest strength of Jesus. As I said earlier, the world of Jesus' day, we're looking for a mighty conqueror to save them and deliver them from the tyranny of Rome. But Jesus taught, turn the other cheek, pray for your enemies. If forced to walk one mile, walk two. His message was consistently the opposite of the conventional thinking of then and today. In the book, The Fruit of the Spirit, written by Trask and Goodall, they write, quote, In our power-hungry, aggressive, win-at-any-cost world, meek sounds like weak. And that's the last thing most people want. After all, we need to survive and get ahead, don't we? Well, Jesus has the clue to survival. He says, learn from me, for I am gentle. Matthew 11, 28 to 30 says, Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Wow. Let me teach you. I am humble and gentle of heart. Jesus was unconventional in his days of walking this earth, and his legacy is just as off the wall in today's world. Jesus didn't go around blowing his own horn, looking for notoriety for his miracles, looking to gain approval or power. No, he was about glorifying the Father. He was surrendered to him looking to please him, 
And in Matthew 12, 18 to 21, after healing some people, he warned them not to make him known. Verse 16, and he quoted this prophecy of Isaiah 42, 1 to 4. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. And here's what it says in verse 19. He will not quarrel or, or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. This is such a wonderful way of describing Jesus' graciousness and his gentleness. He is not silent but will speak truth for repentance and salvation, looking out for the weary and the burdened. How did Jesus do this? Well, let's use an example found in John 4 of the Samaritan woman. Jesus comes to the well, and he speaks with her and asks her for water. She's amazed that a Jew would talk to a Samaritan, let alone a woman, in the middle of the day. He questions why she's there in the middle of the day, and she said, well, she has to avoid the other woman, and he says, other women that come there in the morning. And Jesus says, go get your husband. And she said, I have no husband. And then Jesus proceeds to tell her all of her history. You're right, you have no husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. Jesus intentionally did not belittle her, accuse her, or embarrass her. He was gentle with her. He was the first one that, re that he revealed that he was the Messiah. That's how he treated a woman who had lived a life that many of us would feel is sinful and wouldn't even belong in the church. But look at how Jesus treated her. How about Peter in John 21? Peter is told by Jesus ahead of time at the Last Supper that before the cock crows in the morning, he is going to deny him three times. And just like Jesus said, as the cock crowed, he denied him the third time and ran away and wept bitterly. What did that do to Peter? What did that do for his standing as the head of the, the disciples, his leadership? How did it affect him internally? So they did whatever they knew. In their sorrow, they went back to fishing. And one day they're out fishing and they look to the shore, and there's a man on the beach cooking breakfast. And one of the disciples says to Peter, I think that's the Lord. I think it was John that said that to him. Peter jumps out of the boat and runs to the, to the shore, and, and of course it is Jeter, Jesus, and he's going to serve them breakfast. And after breakfast, he takes a walk with Peter. And of course, this is a time he lets Peter have it. How could you deny me? How could you let me down in my worst time? No, he didn't say any of those things. He turned to Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, I do, Lord. He said, then tend my sheep, feed my sheep, take care of my sheep. Three times he asked Peter if he loves him. He gave Peter the opportunity in three questions, asking him if he loves him, to erase the time that Peter denied him in Jesus's love and compassion for Peter and for us as we fail him as we deny him as we don't stand up for him in times that we should that same compassion comes to us how about what Jesus did for us on the cross through his arrest his trial and his crucifixion when he got arrested he could have called called down legions of angels and they would have come down and taken him off the cross or freed him from arrest. How about during the trials? He could have answered every charge, but he decided to remain silent. And up on the cross, he could have called down curses from the cross, but instead he forgave. And then he worried about his mother, he gave her to John and John to her as his mother. In his gentleness going through the savage pain on the cross, he forgave and he worried about the care and the welfare of his mother. At any time, Jesus could have demonstrated incredible power, but he was gentle. 
Just as he is approachable, kind, and humble, we are to be so also. Uh, With this in mind, what should gentleness look like within the life of the believer? Point six, gentleness is the essence and responsibility of leadership. Whether we're responsible for others in our professional lives, our personal lives, or especially within the church, we are to lead others with the love and caring of a shepherd, being patient and gentle with all those we come in contact with. This takes humility, not found in the world. It takes the humble spirit of Christ. Philippians 2, 6 to 8 says, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. So we need to humble ourselves when placed in a position of leadership or authority. Jesus, who was God, lowered himself to be a slave. How much more should we, as disciples, do the same? Chuck Swindoll wrote this. So then, gentleness includes being calm and peaceful when surrounded by a heated atmosphere, emitting a soothing effect on those who may be angry or otherwise beside themselves, and possessing tact and gracious courtesy that causes others to retain their self-esteem and their dignity. That's what Jesus did in all of those cases that I gave. He allowed those people to retain their self-esteem and their dignity. He had every right to come down on Peter. He had every right to accuse the woman at the well. But instead, he showed love and care to them. You know, I haven't always done this well. It's easy to get caught up in the moment with your emotions and lose focus on your responsibility as a follower of Christ. As I have said on previous messages, these teachings are for me as much, or in some cases more than you. I'm grateful to be loved and forgiven. I am not perfect, but I rest in the hope of growing better every day. Ephesians 4, 1-2 reads this way, Therefore I, a prisoner of serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Remember the gentleness of God, that he was gentle because of his knowledge of our weakness and that we came from dust. He also sh- we should also take into consideration others' weaknesses and faults when showing love and gentleness to them. Christopher Wright writes in Cultivating the Fruit of the Spirit, those who are filled with the Spirit, or who claim to be, must demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, including gentleness, in dealing with those who fail or fall, just as Jesus himself did. Likewise, we as leaders within the church are to be especially patient, loving, and gentle to those of God's family. 1 Peter 5, 2-3 says, Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. In 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 25 from the, uh, it found in the Bible says this, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. In every aspect of our lives, we need to make gentleness as a way of life. Point seven, gentleness as a way of life. Just like the other fruit we have looked at, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness should be an aspect of our walk in our daily and everyday lives. If we are his disciples, patterning ourselves after the master, first being last and last being first, then we will see people and how we interact and treat them like Jesus did. 
will see and treat them like God does, like a father and a loving shepherd. James 3.17 says, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. So, we say, they will know us by our love. That's a song we've sung. They will know us by our love. Love represents all the fruit, because without love, none of the other fruit can exist. Therefore, they will know us by the fruit we exhibit daily in concert with him. 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. If you see yourself as the same or lesser than another, not better or greater, you will be gentle and humble to those around you. Christopher Wright writes in Cultivating the Spirit, the Fruit of the Spirit, humility comes a lot easier when you really know yourself. When you know the weak and flawed person who is living inside the shell you have on the outside. Then, out of a deep well of self-knowledge and gratitude for the grace God has rescued you from your own sin and failure, comes humility before God and gentleness towards others. So, I'd like you, in closing, to recognize that Jesus is the perfect embodiment of a loving faithful, compassionate, and obedient relationship with God. It is characterized by the gentleness and humility of Christ himself. That's how we know how to be gentle and humble, by looking at Jesus, taking on his yoke, allowing him to teach us. He is who we should model ourselves after. And when we do, we show the character of God. So as his disciple, are you displaying gentleness in your relationships and interactions on a daily basis? Is gentleness part of the fruit that you show? Going along with goodness and love? Are they the things that you show people in your interactions each day? I hope you take the time to give some thought to how God shows his gentleness, how Jesus shows his gentleness, and God showing it as a father and as a shepherd, and Jesus showing it through love and caring for those he interacted with. That's how we need to do it as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity again to continue in this series, looking at the fruit of the spirit and one of the greatest of being gentle. That's really hard for us, Lord. It's not part of our, our natures. We're, we're out, many of us, the, at least the world is out for themselves. And gentle sounds like weakness. You can't let yourself appear to be weak. And so all the fruit that, that connects with or resembles being weak, uh, we try to stay away from. But we must recognize of who it is that we're modeling ourselves after. As being disciples of Christ, disciples are to become more and more like the master. So, Lord, as we step out into the world and we're displaying your fruit, and this one especially of gentleness, that people would see Jesus when we interact with them, his love, his care, his gentleness, and so be drawn to him, bringing glory to God first and blessing others in, in the way we do that. Lord, we love you and we pray, praise you and thank you for the gifts you've given us through your son and that we would we ask that you would enable us through your pruning process to produce more fruit and more fruit and greater fruit to bring glory to you in Jesus name amen